Welcome to the recorded version of Introduction to Medicare Coverage, part of the Family Caregiver Support webinar series brought to you by the American Society on Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. Our presenter today is Dr. Amy Dupree. Dr. Dupree, a gerontological social worker, is an internationally renowned expert on lifestyle issues relating to caregiving, retirement, aging, and family dynamics. Dr. Amy Dupree is president of Essential Conversations, Inc., and Dr. Amy, Inc., a company dedicated to family caregiver wellness. Dr. Dupree holds a PhD and master's in social work specializing in gerontology, and she earned her CSA, a designation for which she also trains others, as part of their accreditation. Dr. Amy Dupree is a much sought after speaker at corporate and professional events on the topic of caregiving, aging, and retirement, and she's also a frequent guest on radio and television. And with that, I'd like to welcome our presenter back for another great web seminar presentation, Dr. Amy Dupree. Thanks for joining us today, Amy. Thanks, Steve. Glad to be here, and I want to welcome everyone. I, I, we have a, a very large turnout today for this webinar, and I'm guessing that's because the topic is incredibly confusing to lots and lots of people. So, you know, I, I think when we look at uh, the results of this eHealth Baby Boomer survey that Steve's just putting up, this was published in 2012, and I think this speaks to why we're probably all of us on this we webinar. Many boomers don't understand how basic parts of Medicare work. And you can see here some of the results of the survey. So many of those who were surveyed failed to uh, correctly answer four basic questions about commonly accepted Medicare myths. So the first myth that you see there that Medicare works just like regular health insurance, 60% didn't know that was false. And the second myth that Medicare is free, 30% didn't know that was false. And I'm guessing probably the, the ones who do know that, that that is false have watched lots of TV ads that have led them to understand that Medicare must not be free. And then the third myth that a person can enroll in Medicare anytime after age 65 without penalty, 77% didn't know that was false. And then when we look at Medicare covers everything, 19%, almost one in five persons doesn't know that's false. So I think that this is um, pretty amazing when you look at this. And if you, if you understand who the survey respondents are demographically, it's even more impactful. So nearly half of those who were surveyed were going to be eligible for Medicare within 10 years. So they were pretty close. These weren't 20-year-olds that were being interviewed. And almost two-thirds of those people interviewed had a college degree. And one in four of them had a master's degree. And one in three had a bachelor's degree. So we're talking about a, a well-educated demographic who is close to needing Medicare and they don't really fully understand what's going on, which I speak, think speaks to us as professionals and what we can do because I think we have a role that we can play in helping our clients and our customers understand the basics and then helping them understand what resources exist to help them get more information. The goal isn't that we are going to be able to provide them all the information because, it, first of all, it's hard to stay on top of it all, and secondly, there's a lot of individualization that happens, has to happen. But what we can do at least is give them the basics and point them in the right direction. So let's take a look at what we're going to talk about today. Specifically, we're going to go over these four things. We're going to talk about uh, what is provided, how people can enroll for Medicare, how you can help the people that you serve, and then where your clients can go for more information. So by the end of our time together, you should have a pretty clear sense of those things. And I am guessing today there are going to be a lot of questions uh, that are, are things that are rather specific questions about Medicare. And also, uh, I think there are probably going to be some questions around how this is going to fit with the change in changes we see happening in uh, healthcare. Uh, and some of those questions are going to be too detailed for us to deal with today, and I'll, I'll suggest that you go to a, a different source. But there may also be people on our webinar today, because I know we have lots of very knowledgeable people who are on this call who will be able to answer some of those questions as well. So let's start by taking a look at eligibility. So generally, what we say is a person's eligible for Medicare if either she or he or their spouse worked for at least 10 years in Medicare covered employment, and that's key, is 65 years or older, and is a citizen or permanent resident of the US. So those are the basics to get it. 
And then individuals age 65 also, if they receive or are eligible to receive Social Security benefits, or they receive or are eligible to receive railroad retirement benefits, those still exist, or their spouse receives or is eligible to receive Social Security or railroad retirement benefits, or they are their spouse and their spouse can be living or deceased, and of course it also includes uh, divorced spouses, worked long enough in a government job where Medicare taxes were paid. The final part that we often don't think about here, or two final parts, is also if they are the dependent parent of a fully insured deceased child. That's probably not a situation that we're going to have to deal with much, much here. And then, of course, you see there, too, people of any age who've got certain disabilities or with permanent kidney failure or who are requiring dialysis or a kidney transplant are also eligible. Now, people who don't meet the requirements that we went through may be able to get medical, Medicare hospital insurance, but they have to pay a monthly premium. And usually you can only sign up for this hospital insurance during designated enrollment. So it doesn't mean that they can't get it at all if they don't meet those eligibility requirements, but it does mean they're going to have to pay. Okay, so those are some of the things to think about. Now, most of us just assume pretty much everybody is eligible for, for Medicare. And when you go through that list, you can see that pretty much everybody is eligible for Medicare. Okay, so now let's take a look at enrollment. Because this, I think, is the part that confuses a lot of people. When people first become age eligible for Medicare, which is 65 right now, they have seven months to sign up for Parts A and B. And this is the part I think confuses the people. They just assume they don't have to do anything. How the seven month period works, it includes the three months before and the three months after their birth month. So for example, if someone was born, let's say April 1st, they could sign up starting in January. So they'd have the three months before April, January, February, March. And then they'd also then have the three months after, May, June, and July. So that's how that seven months gets calculated. People are really encouraged to sign up for Medicare three months before they turn 65. And the reason that is, is there's, you know, to get the paperwork done, to get things going, to make sure that people aren't caught without the coverage they want, they really need to do this ahead of time. And it's important, and this is something else that people don't realize, it's important to sign up for Medicare even if someone doesn't plan to retire at age 65. So this is really separate from anything else they're doing, they just need to sign up for Medicare. And I think the thing that a lot of folks don't realize is that if they don't sign up when they're first eligible, then they have to sign up during a general enrollment period. As you can see on the screen, that typically is January 1st to March 31st of each year. But if they don't sign up for Part B when they're first eligible, they may have to pay a late enrollment penalty. So lots of complications about this. Uh, there are also some special enrollment periods that are available for certain groups, and that's why I think the best advice on this one is that if you have someone who's looking at this, have them go to Medicare.gov and click on the Eligibility and Enrollment Calculator, and they can get an answer that's based on their specific situation. And we're going to come back to that website in a few minutes because Medicare.gov is actually a fabulous website. It's pretty easy to maneuver, and it answers a lot of the questions right there. And if somebody doesn't get their questions answered right there, there's a phone number they can call. So again, it, it, it is a very uh, easy to use tool to get specific answers if it goes beyond these very general uh, situations that we're talking about. Now, if someone's already getting Social Security benefits when they turn 65, the Medicare hospital insurance Part A, that's the Part A, starts automatically. And we're going to go through each of the parts in a minute. So. That's an automatic, it's the, the other that they have to sign up for, which is Part B. And again, that's only if they're already getting Social Security benefits. If someone lives in one of the 50 states or Washington, D.C., uh, Guam, Virgin Islands, uh, all these sort of places, they'll be enrolled in Part B insurance automatically. But residents of P Puerto Rico or foreign countries don't receive Part B automatically, and they have to elect for that benefit. And that's why it's so important because many, many of you are working with clients who have very specific situations 
that it's important that you don't just assume that somebody falls into the general category on this. Okay, let's take another look at, at the enrollment part of this. So the best way, as I said, for someone to start is really to go to Medicare.gov. That's the official U.S. government site for Medicare services. And that's where they can go and look at their options for coverage. There are some really handy comparative tools that can help them decide which policy they need, how to get gap coverage insurance, what to do about prescription drug coverage, all that stuff that people really struggle with when they first sign up. They can also determine if their current medical care providers accept Medicare, so in other words, the doctors they're going to or any other medical providers they're going to, and if not, what local doctors and facilities do accept Medicare. This site also advertised the fact that you can get personalized health insurance counseling at no cost from a program that's called SHIP, the State Health Insurance Assistance Program. And it, it's also a good idea to look at some other online sites. So again, Medicare.gov is a fabulous site, but you see we've listed for you three other sites that are really worth taking a look at. So uh, MedicareRights.org is a national nonprofit consumer service organization that works to ensure access to affordable health care for older people and people with disabilities. So it's a great place to go to look up some things. And then uh, another good resource you have there is benefitscheckup.org. With that, it's a free service of the National Council on Aging. And what that site does, which is really helpful, is it asks a series of questions to help identify benefits that could save your clients money and cover the cost of everyday expenses. So worth them looking at and seeing if maybe there's something they can do that could make it less expensive than what they're doing now. And then healthcare.gov helps with insurance options and also provides healthcare prevention and wellness resources. And finally, it's great for your clients to talk to your, their primary care physician, their local senior service organization. They could also, as we say here, visit their state's website for senior services and healthcare. And then I wanna add another one on here that we don't have on here, which is AARP has a section that I think is very clear about Medicare and the differences between things. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna share with you some information from there a little later today. But I think their information is also very clear for people to read. It's written in very uh, simple, understandable format. And I think hopefully people won't need to go to that much work, but those resources are available and each of them could help address the individual concerns and determine what questions to ask if they have to call someone at Medicare. And then you can see, you can sign up online. Uh, what, you can, if you can't sign up online, someone's there and they're on Medicare.gov and they've determined their eligibility and they know that they're ready to sign up, they can do it right then and there, but they may not feel comfortable and they wanna to talk to someone. They simply have to call 1-800-MEDICARE. When they call, if you can remind them, they need to have their social security number, their date of birth, date of residency. They need to know any health insurance company names, policy numbers, and that if they have coverage that they're expecting to go forward, all of that they should really have at their fingertips before calling 1-800-MEDICARE. But with that, uh, the response I have heard from clients is that it has been extremely helpful and that the people who are staffing those lines are very knowledgeable and very good at walking people through their options. Okay, let's just take a quick look at the Medicare Dot gov site so you can see what that is like. So just if you can see up at the top very clearly sign up change plans, uh, what Medicare covers, your Medicare costs, drug coverage, supplement, supplements and other insurance. If you haven't been on this site just because you're not of an age yet to need to and you haven't needed to send clients there, you might just want to maneuver around the site a little bit. It's worth taking a look at some of this and you'll be able to see both uh, the information and how easy it is to navigate. So that's at the top, you know, the claims and appeals, and we did a little drop down box so you can see what that looks like for the drop down there. And then manage your health forms resources. And then on the, the left hand side, you see getting started with Medicare and the coverages and how to sign up, how to apply. So it's, it's all, it's in both places. So it's pretty easy for people to get on and see what they need. And you can see that it's in Spanish, they can change the font size. Now, of course, this assumes that people have a computer and access to do this. If not, 
the recommendation is, of course, call 1-800-MEDICARE. But if they're able to get on and do this, this gives them a lot of information before they actually have to talk to somebody, and then they can ask more specific questions. Okay, so now let's get into the, <laughs> the different parts of Medicare, what it covers, what it doesn't cover, and what people can do. So Medicare Part A, this is the hospital insurance part. It covers inpatient care in hospitals, including critical care and rehabilitation. Part A also covers care in skilled nursing facilities following a hospital stay, that's the key, and it's only for a limited number of days. So I, I think this is one of the things that confuses people the most is they may know a friend who was in a nursing home for rehab and had their nursing home stay covered by Medicare, and so why, if they need to go into a nursing home permanently, is that not covered by Medicare? That confuses people. What Medicare Part A doesn't cover is, of course, the long-term stays. It also doesn't cover non-skilled help with activities of daily living, so things like the bathing and the dressing and the eating and the toileting. Part A does cover hospice care for the terminally ill, as well as some limited home care, home health care services and supplies if the doctor says they're medically necessary. But again, it's not the long term. Everything is about rehab for this and getting better, except for hospice. And I think that, that benefit is what often confuses people, too, because of, of the hospice addition to that um, often makes people think that then all long term must be covered. Okay, so Medicare Part A is hospital insurance. Let's take a look at Medicare Part B. Medicare Part B is the medical insurance part. So this is what's covering doctor services and services from any other medically necessary healthcare providers. And that includes diagnosis and treatments. It also, as you can see on the screen, covers outpatient care, durable medical equipment, and some home health services. Part B also covers some preventive services, things like flu shots, cancer screenings, or tests for certain medical conditions such as diabetes and cardiovascular health. So this is the part I think people have to, are, are, are more and more understanding, but they don't get the difference between what A and B is. And so that's key. Now let's take a look at C because I think C really confuses people because they think it is a Medigap policy. So Medicare Part C is also called Medicare Advantage. And this is not a Medigap policy. And by the way, this is one of the places where uh, AARP has a really very, very good description of this. Uh, and they talk about what Med Medicare Advantage is. And they say, Medicare Advantage comprises a variety of private health plans, mo most often HMOs and PPOs. That, that Medicare offers as a coverage alternative to the traditional program. So traditional program, of course, is, is A and B. And it says every plan, this is every Medicare Advantage plan, uh, must cover all the same benefits that traditional Medicare covers, but the plans can charge different copayments, often lower than the traditional program, but not always, and offer extra benefits. Most charge a monthly premium in addition to the Part B premium, but some don't. Most include prescription drug coverage at no additional cost. Some cover routine hearing and vision services, usually as a separate package for an additional premium. Another difference from the traditional program is that most plans require you go to doctors and other providers within their service network or pay higher copays for going out of the network. Okay, so I think that's a pretty good description of Medicare uh, Advantage, the Part C. Uh, the idea, again, that this is not supplemental or gap coverage technically. So when people talk about, well, if I, if I have Medigap, do I need Medicare Part C? It's an either or on that. Okay, so now let's take a look at Medicare, or excuse me, I'm gonna to talk to you about preventative visit first. So this is key because once someone receives their Medicare card, and if they signed up either for Part B or for one of the Medicare Advantage plans, then they should schedule their free welcome to Medicare preventive visit during the first 12 months of coverage. This visit is where um, they can really develop a personalized plan to their doctor that hopefully will promote wellness and, and help them improve their current health situation. That's what it's designed to do. And there's more information about that on Medicare.gov as well and the importance of it and the benefits of, of doing this preventive visit. But I think, you know, it's an important thing to 
encourage your clients to do. Okay, now let's take a look at Medicare Part D. So this is prescription drug coverage. And again, because things are rarely simple when we talk about Medicare, there are two options again. So two purchase options. So first is through a Medicare Advantage plan, that's the Part C, what I just described and read to you from the AARP site. Or the second is through a standalone Medicare prescription drug plan from an approved company. Most Medicare drug plans have a coverage gap that's called the donut hole. And I'm sure if, you, if you're working in this field, you have clients who have run into this. So what happens is the donut hole begins after someone, and it could be they have a drug plan as well, has spent a certain amount for covered drugs. And when they reach that amount, then they have to pay the full cost of their prescription drugs up to a certain limit. Now, someone may be able to reduce their gap by using generic drugs or applying for extra help for Medi from Medicare or from state and local programs, but this is often the time when people really start struggling with costs is when they get in this situation because of this donut hole. So they just no longer have coverage and they have to now be paying out of pocket and it can be extremely expensive. So we've just gone through A, B, C, and D. Let's now talk for a minute about the supplemental insurance, which is the Medigap or Medicare supplement insurance. So as you can see, this is according to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. A Medigap policy, which is really called a Medicare supplemental insurance policy, is private health insurance that's designed to supplement the original Medicare, which is parts A and B. Clients have to have both the A and the B to get Medigap insurance. So Medigap, Medicare rather, does not pay any of the costs for a Medigap policy. This is out of people's pockets if they have one of these policies. And Medigap insurance does help pay some of the health costs uh, the original Medicare doesn't cover. So these are things that people, again, often get into trouble with because they don't have copayment they don't have the coinsurance, they don't have the deductible. So the Medigap policies can cover some of that. If someone has the original Medicare and a Medigap policy, Medicare will pay its share of the Medicare approved amounts for, cover, for covered health care costs first. So it first goes to Medicare, then it goes to the Medigap policy to pay whatever's left. Okay, so there, there is a definite order in how this gets done. The Medigap policies do not cover the individual's share of the cost under other types of health coverage, so including the Part C. Standalone Medicare prescription drug plans, Part D, doesn't cover that. It also doesn't cover employer union group health coverage. Um, doesn't, you know, in, it ha doesn't with Medicaid, the Department of uh, VA benefits, or TRICARE. And TRICARE is the benefits that's offered to veterans and to people in the reserve. Now, generally speaking, Insurance companies can't sell a Medigap policy to someone if they have coverage through Medicaid or through Medicare Advantage Plan Part C. So when people are deciding, typically it's a Medigap policy or a Medicare Advantage policy, the Part C. And similarly, if they have Medicaid, then they, they cannot get a Medigap policy. And of course, they shouldn't be sold a Medigap policy because they likely can't afford the premiums or they wouldn't be on Medicaid to begin with, okay? So A, B, C, D, and then we're talking Medigap, which is separate. Okay, so now let's talk about who pays and what happens. I think this chart helps to describe it best. So most people don't have to pay a premium for Medicare Part A, the hospital insurance, because they paid Medicare taxes when they worked. That's what that went for. Now, for others who meet certain age, citizenship, residency, disability requirements, they may be able to purchase Part A, okay? So mo most of us think of people getting that part for free, free in the sense that they've already paid for it. Uh, but if not, then again, they can pay for it, and it's usually in combination with Part B. People who select the B, the medical insurance, pay a monthly premium. So that is not included in the basic Medicare coverage. And then, of course, you can see Part C, Part D, and Medigap all have monthly premiums that are included that. Now, the Medi Medicare Part B premium, the, the monthly premium that you pay for that, 
covers the cost of extra services. So it's things like vision and hearing and dental, health and wellness programs. So the premium is going for something. Part C, uh, the Medicare Advantage, I'm sorry, that's Part C I just said, raise that. For Medicare Part C, that's what the person is paying. So they're paying the, the Medicare Part B premium and then they do the additional premium that gets the things I just said, vision, hearing, dental, health, and wellness. So they have to have Part B in order to get Part C. And then they're paying that extra premium for Part C to get those extra benefits. So if they can afford it, it gives them a lot more coverage. And as I mentioned, we can only join those plans at certain times of the year, and coverage usually only lasts for a year. People can join if they have a pre-existing condition. Part C also covers all of the services under Part A. So the Advantage program covers both, okay? Part D is for prescription drug plan only, and it's available as an extra cost and as an add-on to either Part C or as a separate purchase. So these premiums, as you know, can add up for people because they may end up purchasing Part C and Part D, or they may end up purchasing Part D and a Medigap policy. All of that adds up. And what we want to make sure is that people aren't buying more than they need, but that they do have the coverage that they need. With the point that people really need to understand is that Medicare does not cover everything, and there are often co-pays and deductibles. And as such, many people do opt to choose a Medigap insurance to help cover some of those expenses. And again, remember, that's a private health insurance that supplements people who have Medicare Part A and B, and it's a separate cost. The Medicare coverage usually begins on the first day of your birth month if you sign up for Part A and or Part B during the first three months of your initial enrollment period. So, for example, again, if your birthday falls on April in April and you sign up in January or February, your coverage is going to start on the first day of your birth month. So even if your, uh, your birthday is the, the 20th of April, it would start on the 1st of April. And uh, in addition, again, we have to encourage people to do this as early as possible. Now, when it comes to claims and filing claims, the good news is, if there's good news in all this, is that it's only in very rare cases will someone have to file a claim on their own. If they're in Medicare Part A and B, the doctors and other medical suppliers are required by law to file the Medicare claims for covered services and supplies. If they get their Medicare health care through Medicare Advantage plan, these plans also don't require that you file your claim because Medicare pays these private insurance companies a set amount every month. So that, for people who are trying to figure out, you know, what they're filing and what they're not, that can be helpful to understand. Okay, so I think this chart is a good one to share with people to help them understand what the differences are and, again, the resources that we're talking about. Okay, let's talk about coordination of all these benefits because, as you can see, it can get pretty confusing. So... As you know, many people who have Medicare also have other types of primary insurance coverage. They may have it through an employee health insurance plan or their spouse's employer's plan, or they're getting workman's comp or auto insurance or liability insurance that's covering the car cost of medical care related to an accident. So there can be other people kind of in the mix of this. In those instances, Medicare pays after the primary insurance, and that's key. So other situations exist for those who are on Medicaid or they get the VA benefits or they have TRICARE. And if clients have questions about which policy pays first, they really should contact the Medicare Coordination and Benefits Contractor. And uh, we, we don't have a number on there for you, but I'm going to give you a phone number for that. It's 1-800-999-1118. And I can give that to you again at the when we go over the resources. But one 800 Nine 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 one 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 eight, and then more details can also be found in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services booklet, which you see on there. It's titled Medicare and Other Health Benefits: Your Guide to Who Pays First. It's available online at Medicare.gov. So I know this is confusing. You know, this isn't so bad for baby boomers who are just moving into this, but we have lots of folks who are uh, certainly older seniors, people who struggle with understanding these benefits and understand the changes and how to file, and they need the help of probably someone, either yourself or someone who can walk them through this 
and not just be sent to the website. Um, I think the the boomers who are aging in, who are likely using computers, will find an easier time by going on Medicare.gov as a starting point for this. Okay, let's talk about help with Medicare expenses for people with low income. This can be a real issue because, as you can hear, the expenses can be pretty darn high for people who have Medicare but don't have enough other coverage. So what happens for that? Well, if someone has a low income and few resources, their state, depending on what state they're in, may pay their Medicare premiums. And in some cases, they'll pay other out-of-pocket medical expenses, such as the deductibles and the coinsurance. And that's a state-by-state -state thing, so only the state can decide you know, whether or not you qualify for help from the Medicare savings programs, that's what they're called. And for people to find that out, they just need to contact their state or local Medicaid office, their social service or welfare office, if they call there and they should be able to give them the information. There's often help too for prescription drugs. It's called Extra Help, that's the name of the program, with Medicare prescription costs, they help with that. So again, if someone has limited income, and it's tied, this is when we say limited income, we're talking about tied to the federal poverty level, and they have limited resources, they may qualify for extra help to pay for prescription drugs under the Medicare Part D. So what the Social Security Office role in this program is, because it's kind of, you might say, why would they be calling Social Security, is help them understand how they may qualify, help them complete the extra help application, and they'll process their application. So for that, they need to go to the Social Security Office. If they apply for extra help, an application for the Medicare savings programs will also be started unless they say otherwise. So that, that is a trigger to start the, the Medicare savings program application. People can see if they qualify either by calling Social Security's toll-free number or getting on their website. And again, that office, my experience has been that people have had very, very good experience calling Social Security and getting good response. And, and getting the answers they need. Okay, let's take a look at resources again. So this is obviously a complex topic. The good news is there is a lot of help out there and the resources are actually really, really good. So I mentioned to you benefits checkup as a great starting place. I, I wanna reiterate that because I think it's so important, as well as medicarerights.org. Both of these sites can really help people who are struggling to figure out what they need. But the very best bet is to start with Medicare.gov because that's the official U.S. government site. So go there first. And then there you'll find lots of tools, not just to help with the eligibility, but also to help determine what's the best plan, when to enroll, and how to enroll. And again, if people are intimidated by doing this on the computer, they can call 1-800-MEDICARE. The other situations that we talked about that exist for the, the folks who have the Medicaid Veterans Benefits TRICARE, again, call the Medicare Coordination of Benefits Contractor, and there's the number there for you to look at. Or get on and look at that book, uh, socialsecurity.gov extra help, to try to, to, to help your clients figure out if they are eligible for that program and how to apply for that program. Okay, let's talk about next steps here. It's a lot of information, and uh, hopefully having it laid out in a chart and hearing the A, B, C, D and getting some of the, the information about where to go will help you when you're working with your clients. I think the question you want to ask yourself is, who do you need to be sharing this with? Because there are a lot of people who are not yet Medicare eligible but are getting very close who need to do this exploration now. And so any clients you have who are nearing that time I would really encourage you to, uh, to have a conversation with them, to send them to the resources, to get them thinking about what kind of Medicare coverage will they have when, or need when they get to that age. In addition, I'd really encourage you to talk to people's caregivers if you think they don't have the right coverage or they're not getting the right uh, help so that they can get the right information. Because my experience is that most family caregivers are not aware of the best options for their family members and they just don't have the information. So sharing the resources with them is really, really key. And I would really encourage you again to explore these resources to help yourself better understand what 
your clients need, and ultimately, for most of us, it's what we're going to need, too. I know in, in my own life, my sister, when she turned 65 a couple of years ago, called me thinking I would know right away everything that she needed and, and uh, how to take care of uh, the, the mix between her employer program and whether or not she needed the various levels of coverage right away or should she drop this or have this. And we went through it together, and I afterwards said to her, you know, here's my best opinion on this, but I really think you need to call the Medicare number. She did, got walked through the whole thing, and got excellent help. And she called me back and went through it with me, and I said, you know, there's just no way that someone can understand all the nuances of each individual situation. And that's why you really do need to con con consult with a professional at the Medicare office to make sure that your client's getting the right information for them. Okay, I'm going to stop, and uh, Mary Alexander is on the line with us. Steve? Hi. Glad to join oh. you. Thanks for joining us today, Mary. Glad to be here. Thank you. As you can see from the slide up on your screen, it is time for the Q&A portion of today's web seminar. So text in those questions, and we will pose them to Dr. Amy Dupree as well as Mary Alexander. Uh, first question here, let's get right to it. Uh, at what age do you believe it is appropriate to start discussing Medicare with my patients? And, you know, I, I think at least uh, a year ahead of uh, 65 when they need to enroll is a good time. I think the sooner we get people thinking about this, the better, because it takes a while to go through all the information and it takes a while to really understand it. So there's no benefit in my mind to waiting uh, much longer than that. Uh, Mary, I'm curious what you might say to that. Yeah, you know, um, I'm a I'm a big proponent of planning, and so I would say I we're even starting to see some of our clients, adult children, start looking at um, these discussions and this planning uh, much earlier, around the 58, 59 year old uh, mark, where they're really starting to think about when can they retire and what do their finances look like and what should their plan actually be and so we're starting to see this hap these conversations happen younger and younger and mary i think that's a really good point what you just said and in, in when we start talking about retirement planning for many people this is a big aspect of it you know how is their health care going to be paid for and certainly with uh changes that are going on right now i think this is top of mind for lots of people so I, I would agree with it earlier is better on this. Okay, and as always, we do like to pass on some tips and information that our attendees sent in. Um, first one here, the state health insurance information programs are extremely helpful and, knowledge, and knowledgeable. So wanted to pass that on as well. Another comment here, it may be beneficial to share that Part D, as in David, is a separate enrollment process and SHIP counselors can, can assist if needed on choices, SHIP, uh, S-H-I-P. I'm not really sure what that is. That's the state health insurance plan, yeah. Ah, well, well there yep. you go. And that's, yeah, that's, that's very important. It's a separate enrollment for Part D, which is the prescription drug part of this. Okay, uh, next question. If seniors want additional coverage outside of Parts A and B, should they be referred to Medicare Advantage plans or Medicap plans? <clears throat> you know, I think both Dr. Amy and I, um, you know, have thoughts on this. I, there is no one great solution for any one person. Everyone has different um, assets. Everyone has different needs. Everyone has kind of a different expectation and use of uh, medical um, services. And so this is really an incredibly personal decision based on all of those factors. So, you know, working with, um, with, a financial planner, going through the Medicare.gov site, all critical pieces so that you can best maneuver through this uh, on on what's best for you. So I, w I would be hard pressed to answer that um, as a general comment. What do you think, uh, Dr. I, I mean? I agree. I totally agree with you. And this is one of those things, as I mentioned, AARP has a really good website. And as do those, every other resource that we gave you has uh, – great information, but they actually, you know, I, I, I was on prior to the webinar today just looking for, so where are other good resources we could send people to? And they had a good, what it, what's the difference between um, Medigap and Medicare Advantage? And it, it describes it 
in a very simple to understand way. And I, I read you the part from the Medicare Advantage. I just want to read this from their, their little section on Medigap. It says Medigap can be used only by people enrolled in traditional Medicare, so that's part A and B. It is not a government-run program, but private insurance you can purchase to cover some or most of your out-of-pocket expenses in traditional Medicare. These may include Part B costs, like the 20% you'd otherwise pay for physician's visits and other outpatient services, the Part A hospital deductible, currently $1,100 for each hospital benefit period, most of the cost of medical emergencies abroad, and certain other outlays, depending on which kind of policy you choose. Each of the 10 types of Medigap policies is standardized by law, meaning the benefits of each are the same, regardless of which insurer sells it. But insurers still charge widely different premiums, so it pays to shop around. Then it describes Medicare Advantage, and then it says, you know, uh, comparing and choosing plans, and it talks about how to do that on the Medicare website. So you can actually get on the Medicare website, and it will help you look at Medigap policies and compare whether somebody should do the Medicare Advantage or the Medigap. And again, I would really encourage, after people have done that, to get on and talk to a benefits counselor at Medicare so that they're, they're not left without the coverage they need. Okay, next question. I've been told by my husband's state retirement insurance that they don't pay until Medicare pays or that they will only pay the part that Medicare won't cover. How should I deal with that if, as you say, Medicare doesn't pay until after his insurance has, his insurance has paid? Can you repeat that, Steve? Yes, I've been told by my husband's state re retirement insurance that they don't pay until Medicare pays or that they will only pay the part that Medicare won't cover. How should I deal with that if, as you say, Medicare doesn't pay until after his insurance has paid? Well, I think the key there is it's it's a state retirement plan. And so there are different nuances to it from a state retirement plan versus um, a, a company or an organization's retirement plan. And so, um, you know, Dr. Amy talked about the 800, the free service with Medicare.gov, um, and I would definitely call them and kind of work through it. Sometimes the bills get submitted to both at the same time, and so um, the state plans are are hooked directly in with the Medicare plan, so they they can kind of talk back and forth. They use, they use the same software and stuff. So I would definitely call your the Medicare.gov line and actually speak to a counselor. Okay, uh, next question. There was something mentioned earlier in the presentation that some individuals under the age of 65 may qualify, may qualify for Medicare if they have certain disabilities. What are those disabilities or where can I find out some more information on that? Uh, well, again, we're, you know, we're going to say definitely call and check on this, but younger than 65 with certain disabilities, in, uh, that's permanent kidney failure requiring dialysis or kidney transplant uh, is one of the issues that people have. And, I, and the other disabilities, you really need to call and check out whether or not it is eligible. Mary, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think the part of disabilities is, I mean, you actually have to uh, go through uh, the process of, of being um, listed as disabled, and there's many, many things. I mean, there's, there's mental disabilities, there's physical disabilities, there's all kinds of disabilities that qualify for that. And remember, Medica Medicare, I'm sorry, Medicaid is fin financially based, right, and Medicare is age-based. And so... Um, so again, there's a lot of nuances to that, but but you have to actually be diagnosed with a disability that fits into certain categories by your doctor. Okay, uh, next question: Do Part I, A and Steve, Part Steve, can I? I'm sorry to jump in. I just want to say, nope. you know, that, uh, again, on the uh, the website, uh, it also lists, you know, what those disabilities are, so people can take a look at that and actually go through it. And, and uh, that might be the, a good starting point is to look at that. Okay. Uh, next question. Do Part A and Part B have to be signed up together? So, for example, could one sign up with Part A and use an employer health insurance to cover all the others? Hmm. Uh, my understanding, and I, I, I hesitate to answer this, I am not a Medicare expert. 
so please do not take this as the final word. My understanding is yes on that, uh, that they can be signed up for separately, but please check that out. All right, uh, next question. Can you talk again briefly about the difference between Part B and Medigap? Yes, they're completely different, actually. And, uh, you know, part, so what Part B covers are doctor services and services from other, you know, medically necessary healthcare providers and includes diagnosis and treatments. It also covers outpatient care, durable medical equipment, some home health services. It also covers some of the preventive services such as flu shot, cancer screening, uh, tests for certain medical conditions, things like diabetes and cardiovascular. So that's the medical insurance part of Medicare. Remember, Part A is hospital insurance. Part B is uh, medical insurance. And then they wanted a contrast to Medigap policies. Was that what it was? Yes. Okay. So Medigap policies can only be used if you have that Part A and Part B. So they will pay the some of what is so the Part B cost. There's often uh, 20% that you pay for physicians' visits and other outpatients, Medigap covers that. So it covers that part of the, uh, the, the amount of Part B costs that were not covered by Part B. So if you have Medicare, if you have Medicare A and B, you're still going to be paying 20% when you go to your doctor. With a Medigap policy, it covers that 20%. So that's an example. It also covers the hospital deductible from Part A which currently is $1,100. So it gives you an idea. So it covers those expenses. If you think about the name of it, it makes sense. It's filling the gap. So with A and B, you still have costs you're laying out, and Medigap pol policies cover a lot of those costs. All right, uh, next question. A lot of my patients have Medicare Part A, B, and a supplement. If a patient has Medicare Part C, they still need to acquire supplemental insurance. Is that correct? My understanding is that you either get Medigap insurance or you get Medicare Advantage, which is Part C. Okay, so it's not, it's not both. That's my understanding. Okay, uh, next Mary, question. do you want to add to that or not? No, I, I, uh, I, I think you're right on that. Again, um, there was one question that was that was asked earlier that we didn't necessarily have the answer to, and it was, um, do you need to sign up for Part A and Part B at the same time? And again, this shows you kind of how structured um, some of these answers are. On the Medicare.gov website, it says you need to sign up for A and B if you aren't getting Social Security or reti railroad retirement benefits or if you qualify for Medicare because you have end-stage renal disease or if you live in Puerto Rico. So again, very, very interesting nuances to a lot of the questions that we're dealing with. And so um, I think it just goes to show you that every situation is very, very specific. And that's why a counselor can ask you a, a number of questions, really look at the usage of what you may need, both from your, from your medication side, from your uh, any chronic conditions that you may have, um, kind of your health risk assessment, like where you are in, in, in healthy living, and then help find the right elements to cover you. And, and back to the Medicare, the, the uh, Medicare Advantage or the Medigap, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on the AARP website right now and it says, when deciding whether to buy a Medigap policy to cover expenses in traditional Medicare or enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan, that's the Part C, it's important to look at the details of each plan available to you in order to find the one that best suits your needs. In Pocketbook, Medicare has online programs to help you make the, the comparisons. So in, in my understanding, it is an either or that you have to choose between on those. Okay, and a couple more helpful uh, resources here. Uh, first one here, United Healthcare has a good educational resource. It's called MedicareMadeClear.com. Again, that's MedicareMadeClear.com. Many of the questions and answers that we've been talking about today can be found on this educational resource. There's also a bunch of videos, checklists, graphics, and other tools up there 
to help caregivers and Medicare beneficiaries to learn more about Medicare. Um, also, uh, another pertinent comment, next week is National Medicare Education Week. That's September 15th through the 22nd. And additional resources can also be found at nmew.com. Again, that's nmew.com. And the first website that we referenced was medicaremadeclear.com. Sounds like there's a lot of good resources up there as well. That sounds great. Um, okay, next question here. Uh, with supplemental insurances, do the premiums increase annually because of age? I don't know the answer to that. Mary, do you? I don't. I've not heard of that, but I don't know that. Okay. Moving right along to the next question here. We've got a whole bunch of them coming in. Thanks, everybody, for contributing these great questions. We've got a ton of them here. I hope we can get through most of these before the end of the session. Um, another comment here. I think you should mention that the disability, dis, we're talking about disabilities, disability is one that is determined by Social Security. A younger person, for example, under 65, can get Medicare if they have been receiving Social Security disability payments for approximately 24 months. So, uh, again, some more resources and information for you as well. And I think, Steve, I think it's important to also uh, let the group know that Medicare open enrollment this year is from October 15th to December 7th, and that's for the 2014 year. So. If someone's currently on Medicare and they want to make changes, or if you're just getting ready to, to look to see what you need to do, again, open enrollment for Medicare is October 15th through December 7th. Okay, and as well, another uh, comment here. Uh, please mention that there's a specific time clients can sign up for Medicare supplement or they cannot later. For example, end-stage renal disease clients can sign up when they first receive Medicare or when they turn 65 years old. If not, they cannot then sign up later. Uh, next question here, can you talk a little bit about the quarantined issue periods? Uh, we, we need to talk about some awares, awareness as to the time limits for making decisions. Do you have any uh, information on that? The, the what? Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Quarantined. I don't, I don't have, any, have any information on that. No, I don't have answer on that. Sorry. Okay. If uh, the person who wrote that in wants to write in with a little bit more clarification, that would be great. Uh, another comment here. When I signed up for Part A, I was still working. I called and I was told that I did not, si did not need to sign up for Part B right. until I stopped getting coverage from the insurance I got from, the, from my employment. I was mm -hmm. told I needed to call to get signed up as soon as I knew when I would no longer have that coverage through work. So we are correct. Each situation in every state is different, so um, you, it's, it really is down to a state level. And, and I think that the key to that, which makes sense if you think about it, is the Part B is the health insurance part of this. So a lot of people have health insurance through, uh, you know, an employer and so, or through something else. And, and so they may not have signed up, you know, for Part B uh, because they, it would be duplicative coverage. So that's the situation that that person is describing right there. Okay, and uh, we got some clarification on the last uh, issue. The uh, guaranteed issue is the correct term, not quarantine. So uh, please address the guaranteed issue period. Can you talk about that? I don't know what it is, so I can't. Mary, can you? Well, I don't know specifically what she's asking about. Guaranteed issue when you're looking at like long-term care insurance policies and stuff just means that they, as a group, they will take everyone. Medicare, they... They are they they take everyone. So I'm not sure if she's asking specifically. Are there limitations to being able to sign up? Is there a guarantee issue with Medicare? Um, again, if you have a specific issue, I would definitely deal with a with a Medicare uh, counselor. Okay. Uh, next question. What about switching from an Advantage plan to traditional at any time? Uh, the question is, can you switch from the Advantage to a traditional at any time and not the w other way around? Is that correct? The way I understand it is that you need to do it during open enrollment period. However, there are some um, some changes being made to some of those to, to some of the um, specific requirements um, or provisions. But the way I understand it is that you do it during open enrollment period. But if someone else has anything other than that that's changing for 2014, I'd love to know. 
All right, next question here. I, uh, how can I best inform my clients about Medicare without overstepping uh, boundaries or prying for information? Uh, I, I mean, to me, this is a conversation that we should have with every client um, because I think it is so confusing. And, and again, when we started with that survey at the beginning and you see that people who are uh, well-educated, who, you know, boomers who are well-educated people are struggling with this, that we need to take this out of, of the dark and talk about it very openly and ask people if they have really done a thorough assessment of what their needs are going to be or if they're already receiving Medicare to make sure that they're getting exactly what they need now and encourage them to really do more research, whether it's a phone call to a benefits person or getting on the website. And I, I think you can say to someone, you know, I'm, I'm not – uh, in any way trying to interfere with your personal life. But I do think as, you know, in a professional role that it's my, really my obligation to try to make sure that you're doing what's in your best interest and any way I can support you in that. And Medicare coverage is confusing. So do you need support? Do you need to know resources? Here's a list of them. I think anything we can do to help people with that is really important. Mary, you may want to add to that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think that question specifically hits home for me a little bit. Um, I was talking with my father who's uh, in his late 70s, and um, he, he lives out of town, and I was there kind of helping him with some of his medical bills and some issues he had. And, and I said, Dad, you know what, I just don't think that we have – we have the right coverage, enough coverage. I'm kind of concerned. He goes, well, don't worry about it because the government's just going to take care of me. And there was a moment of pure and utter, like, surprise that I said, Dad, they only do the basics. Like, if there are, there are other things that we need to talk about. So even as a professional in aging, the, I was surprised that I hadn't had the right conversations with my father but, again, I think the older generation just assumes that everything's going to get taken care of by Medicare. So there's, there's planning that needs to be done, but there's education that needs to be done on what it does and doesn't cover. And I think that's all of our jobs is to really help people understand we have to plan for aging, and then we have to understand what the real resources are that we could take advantage of. Okay, well, we are just about out of time for today's web seminar, but I want to thank our presenters, Dr. Amy Dupree and Mary Alexander for Home Instead Senior Care for joining us today. Thank you very much for another great presentation. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Thanks Steve.